Obrigado. Eu queria chamar agora o Paulo, a Paula Miralha, que é curadora do Arco Futuro 2014, que vai apresentar os convidados dessa noite. Boa noite. O Arco Futuro teve início em 2011 com o objetivo de instalar um amplo fórum de debate sobre os desafios enfrentados pelas cidades brasileiras na atualidade. Esse ano, ele tem como tema a cidade à água, e profissionais de diversas áreas se reuniram para debater esse tema em setembro no auditório do Birapara, em São Paulo. Mas, além desse assunto específico, o Arco Futuro, em 2014, vem propondo reflexões sobre outros temas ligados também à organização urbana, tais como planos diretores, parques urbanos, espaços públicos, modos de construir e ocupar a cidade. A série de diálogos urbanos que a gente está abrindo aqui tem como objetivo aproximar especialistas de diferentes áreas para discutirem temas pertinentes às cidades nos dias atuais. Hoje, a gente vai abordar esses temas falando da relação entre cidade e arte. As cidades brasileiras ainda estão descobrindo seus espaços públicos e, sobretudo, a vocação desses espaços. Hoje, eu diria que eles são espaços de interação, de troca, de fruição, mas também de fricção, são espaços de disputa. Ao mesmo tempo, as nossas cidades ainda enfrentam desafios impostos por processos de urbanização pouco planejados. Nesse contexto, faz sentido pensar na arte como uma ferramenta de sociabilidade e interação com a cidade? É possível e desejável pensar na arte pública como uma arte com compromisso? A gente tem visto cidades passando por processos de recuperação, inclusive econômicos, por meio de intervenções artísticas. Mas o que faz da cidade, ou de um determinado espaço, público mais ou menos receptivo a esse tipo de intervenção. Esses são processos absolutamente espontâneos ou eles são planejados? Para falar sobre a cidade e a arte e inaugurar a série de diálogos urbanos, temos a honra de convidar dois grandes nomes, Richard Serra e Michael Kilmerman. Nascido em São Francisco, em 1938, Richard Serra é um dos artistas mais expressivos de sua geração. Suas obras ultrapassam os ambientes expositivos dos museus e se fundem com o espaço público, tornando-os indissociáveis e sublinhando a relação entre o trabalho, seu entorno e seus observadores. Um dos maiores críticos de arquitetura e arte da atualidade, Michael Kuberman, tem se consagrado como um advogado informal das casas sociais, abordando temas como habitação social, espaços públicos, infraestrutura, desenvolvimento comunitário e responsabilidade social. Finalista do prêmio Pulitzer em 2000, Point Fellow da Yale University, Frank Visiting Fellow no Whitney Center for the Humanities em Yale, Kuberman contribui, fre contribui frequentemente para o New York Review, New York Review of Books. Nós teremos aproximadamente uma hora de conversa entre os dois e depois a gente vai abrir para perguntas da plateia que devem ser entregues, entregues por, escritos, a, a, por escrito a pessoas identificadas. As perguntas podem vir em português. Chamo agora para o palco Richard Serra e Michael Kilmerman. Hi, Michael. So, I'm going to begin just saying a couple of things. Oh. Um, so, we're going to explore today a somewhat less frequently discussed area of Richard's work, which relates to cities, public space, uh, and the public sphere. Um, Richard famously turned away from traditional techniques and materials, from the pedestal and uh, from carving and clay and marble, and he adopted rubber and steel and lead and pursued actions like propping, leaning, tilting. Paul Clay famously talked about drawing as taking a line for a walk. Richard has taken sculpture on a, a cross-country sprint along the way, unpacking its most basic features, volume, mass, density, gravity, space, including the space between parts of a sculpture, and time, meaning the time you take to move around or through that sculpture, during which the sculpture 
and its relationship to you and its surroundings constantly shifts, an interesting issue in relation to public space. Richard likes to talk about Jackson Pollock as an influence, which I think is appropriate because really no artist since Pollock has achieved what Richard has, to fundamentally redefine his medium. The question we'll address today is how this work has related to the public spaces it often occupies. Richard has spent a lot of time devising sculpture in public. He's a city guy, as you heard, born in San Francisco, living in New York, where the streets downtown played a major role in his career starting in the 60s and 70s. And he knows that at the heart of any great city, and often an engine of its economy, is culture. So how does art, in particular his own, contribute to the lifeblood of a city and to its progress? What is the artist's role in making urban places? And has this actually mattered much to Richard? I think it's useful to note that he has not taken on any public commissions in the United States, that is, commissions from public institutions or from the government since Tilted Arc in the early 1980s. Does he see what you might call the social good of public art as a goal or a hindrance to his own syntactical agenda? Is his job to make spaces people want to enjoy or to invent forms that may result in those kinds of spaces? So I throw out some of those questions and I wanted to begin, Richard, by asking you a little bit about um, New York as you settled in it in the 60s and how it helped to form what you started to do as a sculptor. Um, when I came to New York, um, I was, had been in Europe for two years and a close friend of mine was Philip Glass. And we both came back to New York and lived in lower Manhattan. And on the same block there was uh, Steve Reich and I had gone to school with um, Chuck Close. And together we formed a moving company called Low Rate Movers. And there was a person named Spalding Gray. And um, so we had, and there was another man named Michael Snow as a filmmaker. So there was a filmmaker and two composers and a painter and uh, someone who ended up being a person who did monologues. And we were able to support ourselves uh, with the truck because we would use it two or three days a week and then we'd have four days off. But what was interesting about the group is that no one defined themselves as an artist and all of us were very young and all of us came from either the working class or the middle class, and all of us were opposed to the um, institutions and the aesthetics of what was being um, fed down through the universities. So there was a clear understanding amongst us that we had to redefine whatever activity we were doing, and that became a problem for me because um, there were things I just did not want to do. I didn't want to use a pedestal. I thought that seemed to be about a person, a place, or an event. I thought work ought to come off the pedestal. I didn't want a model. That seemed to be, to use an armature and model with clay seemed to be totally conventional. I didn't want to construct like constructivists, even though the people I admired in New York at the time were Judd and LeWitt and Morris and um, others. and. Uh, what I thought I would do is try to um, invent by writing down a list of verbs that I would enact uh, to roll, to cut, to fold, to twist, to dapple, to curve, things like that. Um, yeah, Richard, you, you raise a couple of issues, one of which is you moved to the city. So, I mean, what was it about the city and that neighborhood that attracted you in the first place? It was cheap, and there... Uh, you could have a loft about uh, 48 feet wide, 85 feet long for $75 a month. Uh, when I first moved in, uh, my mother came to see me from San Francisco. Uh, there was no elevator, uh, there was no hot water. I had a bed in an empty loft on a mattress. I'd been to Yale and I had a Fulbright. She came in and looked out the window and said, marvelous. And then, that's <laughs> as much support as I needed. Yeah, but there was also something about the aesthetic of the city, the, it's the, the things that were around you, surely, because they became the stuff of your art, literally the stuff that was in the streets. No, but I didn't move there because there was junk on the street. I moved there because I wanted the loft and I wanted to make work and um, I wanted to find a way to support myself and I wanted to have as much free time as I could. 
And I really wanted to define a new way of working, albeit I didn't know what that was going to be. I just knew what I didn't want to do. So, so, how did you arrive, so how did you arrive at using materials that were then unconventional, like... There was a rubber. warehouse around the corner on West Broadway that was emptying out all its rubber. I phoned up the CEO and said, can I haul away the rubber? And he said, you can take as much as you want. So with Phil Glass and Steve Reich and a few other people, we hauled up about a couple of tons of rubber, and it was like getting a grant of material, and I started to cut it and fold it. And what, actually, one of the very first pieces I did with it is I took a piece of rubber on its thin edge and just lifted it up, and it free stood uh, like a topological curve that had inside and an outside. Um, and it was called to lift, and I had it in my studio, and I would look at it, and I didn't know if it was a work of art or not, but I knew that it didn't look like something anyone else had done. And at the time, Phil Glass was working as a plumber and then working with me part-time, and uh, we started to roll up some lead rolls. We'd take a sheet of lead and 35 sheet of feet of lead and roll it up and look at it and say, well, that's not much. And then we would take a sheet of lead and roll it from both ends as a double roll, and that didn't interest us. And when finally we got to a triple roll, we thought we were getting somewhere. But we were very interested in how are we going to maintain this experimentation and, um, and possible invention without um, dealing with what was in front of us. And we knew the stakes were high because I had been in Paris and uh, sat across from Giacometti at the Coupole, and what I admired about him was the fact that he represented process in the studio. And I had been in Brancusi's studio as a young student drawing every day, and I understood the history of what sculpture had been up to that time. And I understood that if you're gonna do anything thoughtful, you have to um, define your own territory. But I didn't know how, in fact, I was going to do that. And one of the things that really interested me was the basics of tectonics. How do you build? How do you get something up off the floor? And there was a very good artist, and he's still a very good artist, named Carl Andre, who had put steel plates, lead plates, zinc plates, magnesium plates, aluminum plates, copper plates. You can go through the whole valence chart of plates on the floor. And he was interested in physicality and what he called plastic, which means nothing was joined, no welding. So one day I said to Carl, somebody has to get your plates up off the ground. And he said, don't worry, Richard, someone will. And I thought, yeah, God damn it, I will. <laughs> so I took four plates and I leaned them up against each other and they were in my, in my loft on the sixth floor. It was a bitch to get them up there. And uh, we put dunnage, which is wood in the inside, so they, if they imploded, they wouldn't go through the floor. And um, it free stood, and it was a weight a ton. And it was just balanced. And I was married at the time, and my wife came to see, and she said, that's not art. You shouldn't be doing things like that. It's dangerous. And I said, well, I think I'm going to show it. And she said, no, you shouldn't do that. You'll leave that alone. You're really up to no, no good and stop smoking dope. And I said to her, if, um, if you I want can't a divorce, show is what this, you said to her. Pardon? You want a divorce. That's what you said to her. That's right. You heard the story. <laughs> but listen, Richard. Uh, Hal Foster said to me, that's not the only reason I got divorced, but that was really crucial. Yeah. I mean, if you're living with someone who doesn't like your art, you're in, you're in trouble. This is true, but this is really going off track from where I thought we were going to go in this conversation. Oh, Though true, we can go this way if you true, want. True romance. <laughs> so listen, I, 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 this, the, the talk about your early, the, this the early work is important, but I, I want to I stick as much as we can to questions of place and circumstance, and then the publicness of this. So let me ask you a couple of questions. I have to say, I, I bet to a lot of young people in this audience especially, there's a, there's a mythology to what you're describing. A cheap place to live, a community of like-minded people who have different interests, ready materials, and places in which you can show this stuff. This, and, is, and this is the nature of an urban, a creative urban and, environment. And people who meet every day together, who share work, and who share um, common interests, who share food, who share um, restaurants, who share dancing, yeah. who, who share music. Um, I can tell you a little offbeat story about um, Steve Reich, and yeah. I know we have an hour, but I think yeah, it's, okay. it's an interesting little vignette. Yeah, do it. When I first met Steve Reich, he was living right down the corner. He had graduated from Harvard, he majored in philosophy. I said, what are you up to? And he said, well, I've been doing some tape music. And I said, what have you taped recently? And he said, I went up to Harlem, and I went into a tank where a kid had just been arrested, 
and the kid had been arrested. He wanted to get out of the holding tank. And so he said he squeezed the bruise till the blood came out. And I said, what? And he said, well, listen to this. And he turned on this tape, and the tape said, I squeezed the bruise till the blood came out. I squeezed the bruise till the blood came out. I squeezed the bruise till the blood came out. I squeezed the bruise till the blood came out. The blood came out. <laughs> and pretty soon, you have Steve Reich's music. Yeah. And Steve Reich's music, um, which is looped, and I introduced him to Phil Glass because I'd been living with Phil Glass in Paris on and off. And they got along famously because both of them were interested in serial projection. But what's interesting about Steve Reich was that was political. He was taking political language and putting it into a tape loop. And I thought, this is an, a very interesting group of people. But yet, none of us had any recognition and none of us were defined. Right. And also, may I say that you, money was not really at stake here. That is, you wanted to make a living, but there wasn't an enormous amount of money to be made, right? You weren't, none of you were doing this because there was... Depends how much you want to drive the truck. <laughs> yeah, okay, so from the driving of the truck. To, how much do you think the work that you did, and not just you, but other people in that community, the work that they were doing, spoke to the, the, the place itself, the nature of the streets, the... You know, there was a lot of that work that, that um, made use, as you did, of the materials you could find, whether they were dumpsters or whether they were doing things on the roof and with fire escapes and with Trisha Brown and so forth. There seemed to be a lot of the work that related to the city, the sense that you were incorporating the city and, and making the city part of your work. Yeah, I think the women were instrumental in leading it because Trisha Brown was actually climbing up the walls of buildings, doing pieces on top of the walls of buildings. Joan Jonas was doing performances on the street in empty lots. Um, there was a lot of work going on on the street for each other. There wasn't work being done in galleries or institutions. And it was during Vietnam, and the slogan was, don't trust anyone over 30, and no one did trust anyone over 30. So it was really a kind of solidarity of young people trying to find their own way. Yeah. You, by the way, have not moved so far from that neighborhood. So no, a block and a half. Right. So since we're in Rio, not in New York City, would you say that neighborhood has changed over the years? Yeah, when I first moved there, um, it was produce markets down to the water, and then they burned them all down, so there was nothing down there at all, and there was very few people living there. The people who worked in the produce markets, the produce market would go on from about four in the morning to maybe eight or nine in the morning, then it was empty. So it was like a wasteland. There wasn't a very few population, little po very little population there. But we had freedom. And I think the group of people that I came up with is basically what we wanted was our own time to investigate our own needs and experiment with what we thought we could do and make. We're showing a slide here, and you should explain what it is. That's you and Philip Glass, isn't it? Yeah, um, we were invited to a show by Harold Zeman called Square Pegs and Round Holes, which later became a show that went to Bern called, um, what was it called when it went to Bern? They just reproduced it in Venice last year. Well, when attitude becomes form. And the first thing I did when I went there is I uh, got a Bombla tank to heat up. I heated up a couple of tons of lead. And with Phil Glass and myself, we uh, splashed it against the wall of the outside of the institution because we wanted to join the institution to the sidewalk and to the street and to the passerby. Why, Why did you want to do that? We wanted to take it out of the prestige of the Stedelijk. And we wanted to bring it to the awareness of the people in the town that art could also confront the building a as a possibility of resistance to what was the institutionalized notion of making art. It wasn't very well appreciated by other artists in the town because they ripped it off the same evening we put it up. <laughs> but um, How long did it last? Uh, probably about six hours. <laughs> right. But uh, but the impulse was then to bring the art into the street, literally into the street. I think it's no different than the impulse that kids have today to do graffiti. And I must say some graffiti in this town is quite great to look at because it's not just language. Some of it is actually drawing cartoons or pictures. And I think it's, it's about making and doing. It's about the need to tag or the need to get your own um, identity out there. And 
I think for me it was about how do I make sculpture by using um, a mold of a building as a architecture? How do I cast off a building? Later on what we did is we uncorked this um, splash and if you turn it over you have a right angle and we pulled the right angles off the wall and so what we were doing was using the architecture as a mold for making sculpture. I mean, since I mentioned Pollock earlier, can we say that there was also something about the gesture on using splashing that maybe had something to do with trying to link what you were doing with what Pollock was doing? I, I, I think people, because they look at the splash and they think, oh, this is coming out of Pollock. Actually, in order to make this piece, I had to do it ladleful by ladleful. And if you're doing it ladleful, it's like taking a cup. And if you think about Pollock and his continuous movement of dripping, it, which is almost like a kabuki dance. This is much more a uh, repetitive, laborious activity, even though the final result may look like an expressionist splash, it wasn't built that way. I, mean, I, I, think Pollock, I think Pollock, we now know, practiced a lot of his lines and practiced a lot of his trips and repeated them. There was a certain choreographed and orchestrated quality to that. But I meant it in a more general sense, that is, if we can agree that Pollock was inventing something, a, a way of making a gesture that hadn't existed before, surely you were thinking, by doing this with lead, in a, by working with ladles of splash lead, you were also moving beyond traditional ways of making sculpture. Yeah, I was taking liquid and making it into a solid form, and it had heretofore nothing to do with the way anyone had ever defined sculpture, nor did I know whether it would be accepted as sculpture. One never knows. Right. I mean, all you can do is offer it up. Clearly, after six hours, it wasn't, but soon, uh, soon it was. Well, not so soon. Yeah. Well, what was, t tell me, but since he's here, what was Phil Glass's role in this? How was he... Uh... Phil and I were kind of... Um, we played all, each, each off each other in terms of thoughts. And uh, we were both interested in the fact that if you repeat something, it doesn't become the same. It becomes different. And if you repeat it enough, it actually goes out of phase and becomes something else. And ideas often arise from where it gets obscured. And there was, a, there was a lot of what he was doing in music in terms of extending sound that I was doing in trying to understand what I was making that was very similar in the relation to process and time. So we became people who were answering each other's questions. Yeah. And we worked together, I think, almost over two years, possibly three. That's, that's extremely interesting. Um, to, to what extent, I, what we want to return to this question because I think it'll be a theme, but you raised this as something you wanted to do in public to move outside the museum and to actually question the institution of the museum as being the arbiter of where art was shown and what kind of art. How much did you care about the, the public's part, participation in reaction to this? In other words, how much was this work in your mind made um, for a public? Or how much was it for you? I, I wasn't of thinking of a public at all. You weren't? No, I, I was thinking maybe a passerby would take, give it a nod, but I didn't have the public in mind. I had trying to make my work as sculpture in mind. And it was, uh, in that sense, self-regulating and about my own need to see my experience um, extended into the public realm. But I wasn't worried about how the public would receive it. Right. Uh, so obviously, obviously, they didn't receive it too well. <laughs> and you weren't making what is now often called public art by doing this? Well, maybe. All right, let's come back to that question. So this is a work you did in the Bronx. Tell us a little bit about this, because this was made in the street. This was done in 1969. I wanted to build a piece in the street in New York. I went to the Parks Department and asked them for a permit to build a piece in New York City. They said you could work in the Bronx, but you can't work in New York City. Uh, I put my $250 down, I got my permit, and I went to look for places in the Bronx, and um, the Bronx actually was a very criminal neighborhood at that time. This is 183rd and Webster. This is a dead-end street where the criminals torch their cars and strip them down. And what I liked about it, not only was it a dead-end street, but there was a wall that went up, a, a solid stone wall, much like stone walls here but it was actually a, kind of a mountain almost. And uh, on, there was a stairway going up so you could look down at the end of this dead end street. I grew up in San Francisco in the sand dunes and there was a streetcar line that went to the end. And at the end when the streetcar would turn around, it had a roundabout, it had a steel um, implantation in the ground. Yeah. 
And so what I did is I took two right angles. If a right angle has a flange like this, top part would be what's on the ground. If you turn the right angle over, the width is what sticks up from the ground. So the piece made a form out of uh, two right angles inverted into the end of the dead end street. Um, the Whitney was doing a show, the Whitney Annual, and they invited me to the show in the Whitney Annual, and uh, I said, okay, I'll give you a photograph of what I did in the Bronx, thinking that the people who went from the LA County would go to, you know, New York and see the Whitney and then go to the Bronx. Sadly to say, nobody went from, <laughs> nobody went from New York or LA to see the piece in the Bronx. Yeah. So, I mean, that shows even if you step outside of the institution and put a residue, say, of a photograph in the museum and say, hey, there's a piece up in the Bronx, the audience is certainly not going to look at a steel circle at the end of a dead end street where people are torching cars. Yeah, although maybe that's changed as well because there's a whole kind of culture now of, of pilgrimages to go to see Spiral Jetty, which you worked on, to go to Lightning Field, to go to other places where the going of it is part of the, the, the work. People are probably doing this more than maybe uh, Smithson ever expected anybody would go. After all, a work like Spiral Jetty was itself, technically it's in public, but it was a work that was itself represented in a museum in New York City through photographs and film. I, I think something I have to mention, I think, I don't know if it's true now because now we have a cultural industry that's global that has a lot to do with branding of young artists. You have artists hiring 150 people or whatever, and they become small corporations. But I think at the time, kids in their 20s really had almost an ethical imperative not to do what their elders had done. And I, I don't know if that still exists, but that seemed to be our raison d'etre. I mean, that was the reason to invent. That was the reason to experiment in order to break new right. ground. Right. I mean, this is slightly a different subject too, but I think this is a very different culture. This is, at right now, you're describing something that is quite different in art, that there was this desire to zag because everyone had zigged before, and that's how you make new things. But you see, I never know where the models are coming from. It could be that also young people are going to resist the culture that's in now because it is a hand-me-down of a kind of global JPEG, and they may not want to sign their name up to be a brand, or they may be all willing to jump in. I don't know. Yeah. I, I think it presents a contradiction for young people. Yeah, I mean, one of the models of this that I think makes it very appealing to, to young people now, but also seems uh, mysterious, is that you have, uh, you know, you can do so much, you have such an open playing field, partly because money was not at stake. You weren't doing this, you weren't ex expected to have a, you know, a lucrative career by doing this. You were exploring ideas. This has changed as well. Surely money has had an effect on that. Yeah, this was a doc, this piece was shown in Documenta in uh, 77. This is in, in German. Yeah. In German. And, it's um, called Terminal, is that right? Terminal, yeah. And people in Kassel wanted to keep it in Kassel. And I was working with a dealer in uh, Bochum, which is in the Ruhr where the steel mills are. And I was very interested in the piece being placed where it is now, uh, next to the streetcar tracks, because I wanted it to be involved with the circulation of the city. I wanted it to be kind of a nodal port within the traffic. So um, we made a proposition to the city, and we prevailed, and the piece was put up in 77, and it was just recleaned, and, it, and it's still up. And it's uh, four trapezoids, which you walk into side, and it's open to the sky of square inside. But why did you want it on that particular site? What is it that you felt it was doing in that site? Well, it fronts the uh, train de depot. So you have a large mass of people moving across this streetcar track into the train depot every day. So it permits the possibility of a great deal of people having to contend with um, a space that they can go into or out of, or a sculpture in their midst that they don't know what to make of. And in a sense, it challenges their notion of what they always thought a sculpture was, because for them, up to that time, a sculpture was probably someone sitting on a horse with his two legs up or one leg up or four legs down, depending whether he was shot or wounded or died in bed. Right. Okay, so you were challenging their notion of sculpture. Did you feel that you were in some way 
enhancing the neighborhood? That wasn't my purpose. My purpose was to try to extend and define my art. Did I think it had the possibility of extending the neighborhood or enhancing the neighborhood? I think if work is asked to be accommodating, to be subservient, uh, to be useful to, to be required to, to be subordinated to, then I think the artist is in trouble. I think what the artist has to do, if he can, if he can get away with it, is try to redefine the space as it exists to make it one of a sculptural concern, which is often um, in contradiction to the concern of the city planner, the concern of the architect, the concern of the circulation, and try to redefine it in terms of what the sculptor thinks he needs to do to re redefine it in terms of sculptural space. That often presents not only a contradiction, but an impossibility because you're asking taxpayers to pay for a useless work of art that they don't like, that they think is ugly, and that no one particularly cares for. So if you ask me, do I think I'm making a cultural contribution in the intervention of placing this work there? Not at the time, but the work is still there, and the people have rallied around it, and it's become kind of a symbol for the town. So, but at one point, yeah. The two political parties, the SPD and the other, the CDU, yeah. it became a political football. So the one party would pl plaster it with their placards and the other party would plaster it with their placards. So it's always become kind of an, an action, you know, reason for people to rally around. Right. Okay. See, I don't think you ever know the consequence of an activity until it's there to be consequential. Yeah, but you have to get it there, and you describe something, I don't want to, I want to unpack a little bit what you just said, because it's, we, we should be very clear about what you're saying. So much of when we talk about art in public, we're talking about a kind of art that is made by consensus, ha, follows that list, essentially, that you just gave. Accommodation, you know, and so forth. Um, you're, you're saying, essentially, if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, you're saying, essentially, that as an artist, you are, and this is a question I posed in that little introduction, you believe that your task is to, um, to push questions of your own syntax and form, and to, in some cases, do that in a public place, and that work then may or may not enhance that place in the traditional ways that people think of enhancing. That is to say, you, you just were describing doing something that may contradict what the planner does, contradict what the architect does, not be what the community thinks it's asking for. But that by virtue of the quality of that work, people may come around to it, as you're saying has happened here. Your agenda, though, is specifically your own, not to do community improvement, correct? Yeah, I don't do applied art. I don't do decoration. I think a lot of people do, and they, they do it quite well. Yeah. But that's, that's not what I do. Yeah. What I try to do is to redefine public spaces. And I, I work with architects, and sometimes architects are very helpful, sometimes they resist. And, and I work with city planners, it's not, I'm, I'm not opposed to talking to people. But, you know, you don't build pieces unless there's a consensus of some economy coming together, some planning coming together. Um, yeah. So there has to be some public will to allow you to do what you want to do. And the people who have to take it um, with belief that they are participating in something that's worthwhile, even though they don't know. You see, I, I'm not a, a civil servant, and I think if artists want to be civil servants, that's okay, but that's not what I do. Right. So, let me ask you just a general question. What is then the role of art in a public place? What is it supposed to do then? I think at best it can challenge people, and it can challenge people to perceive and think in ways they haven't thought before, and to engage them in walking into and through in spaces which are, haven't been defined by architecture, which are the provenance of sculpture. Albeit there's a lot of bad sculpture in the public, but I would even applaud the bad sculpture in public because it's out there. And once it's out there, little children go down the street and they say, mommy, what's that? And she says, it's sculpture. And they grow up with the idea that, oh, there's sculpture in our city. And if you look to any city that's healthy, if you look to any city that's exciting, 
It has art in its public places. If you look at cities that are suppressed or repressed, no art in public places. Right, but most art in public places, let's, uh, anyway, l let's say most art made over the last 25 or 30 years in public spaces is not very good. Would you concede that? Uh, let's wait and see. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> no, but I'm saying... I mean, you'd, ha you'd have to name names. I, I could do it, but I mean... I could do it, but, but let, let me just say that because it is born of a process which you said you don't want to participate in, that is to say, it comes out of this idea of, of, you know, we should put art out here because it's good for people to see art in public spaces, but it's nonetheless part of a political consensus. Much of, much of it doesn't really probably interest you. Is that fair to say? Well, if you're going to have it as part of a consensus and you're going to have people vote for art, uh, we're going to have Toys R Us, we're going to have Pink Elephants, we're going to have, you know, I think that came up during the Tilted Arc hearings. And I don't think you can have art by public consensus, even though that seems to be the most democratic way of thinking about it. Nor can we have science by public consensus, because you can't vote for somebody's um, new theory. I think there are experts in their field who choose people to participate in the public realm, and then those people do follow their needs to make art, and they do what they do. So let me, let me push you about this. So that, you know, one of the problems that uh, architecture has encountered in, in uh, I think, lately, is something of this attitude. So maybe we need to differentiate art and architecture. And that is to say, you have architects who are very brilliant at what they do formally, materially inventive, but their works may not actually be um, very practical. You at the same time have um, communities which have enormous needs and which uh, may understand those needs even better than people in government. And so there is an understanding that communities should be able to participate in their own improvement, to describe what they need. And we're in Brazil where you have lots of favelas where this is certainly true. The people there may know very well what their needs are better than a government which imposes things on those favelas. No, I think it comes out of, out of the context. I think... Fine. So we think... But what I'm saying then is, I just want to be clear, what I'm saying is you have an idea that good communities, better improved communities may grow out of community participation and a kind of democratic process that recognizes the value of public will. But you're saying that art does not necessarily, good art does not necessarily grow out of that process. No, it could grow out of that process giving the context, a certain context in a given fragment of a group of society may decide that their sons and daughters are making what they think is um, a good thing to do in their community and support that. Mm -hmm. Let's I, I, think, I think it has to come from the ground up. I don't think it should be dictated by the government institutions down. But I, what has to come from the ground up is an understanding that art has a role even if that art that is there is not something that's actually created out of consensus, that there is an understanding that art itself is a good. Well, first of all, there probably aren't going to be that many people who want to form a consensus. It's probably going to have to take a localized group of people within the community that want to support the efforts of the young people who want to make art. Actually, we went to the favela yesterday, which I thought was very interesting, is that there were some unbelievably interesting drawings on walls. Yeah. Let, let's move on to a couple of slides, because I want to push forward with some of the works you've done. This is in New York, and maybe you need to describe where it is. These are two works, actually, and one of them is seen at the top of the slide and the other in the foreground, um, the foreground being what St. John's uh, Rotary Arc, right? And yeah, one is a three-plate piece at the very end of uh, the street over here. See it sticking up? And the other piece is St. John's Rotary Arc, and TWU is built for the Trans Workers Union. Right, this is definitely not what we were talking about. There no, we go. Yeah, you, there you go. And this one is built around the uh, exit of the Holland Tunnel, so it kind of um, implicates the driver in the revolution of the um, roundabout. So essentially that roundabout, so people are clear, people are coming into Manhattan out of this tunnel from New Jersey. Yes. And they're turning around this roundabout. Yes. And 
why did you, what is that piece that you put there and why did you it's put it there? It's a 200 foot um, arc that just happens to be a quarter circle. I didn't think it was. And um, I staked it out and with the uh, goodwill of Leo Castelli, it funded it and it stayed there for years until there was an uproar about Tilted Arc and then they pulled it, right, pulled it down. Really? I didn't know that. Yeah. Huh. And d just describe the sighting of that work. What, what is it? We obviously are seeing it from, is this from a building or from a helicopter? This is That's from, from a helicopter. But when you walk it or when you drive it, it um, accordions, it either opens or closes. And it um, either invites you into its concavity or um, allows you to see its obdurateness on its convexity. The thing that I always found interesting about curves is that you look at one side, it's a big open field of embracing, and if you look at the other side, it's resistant. And this was actually the first curve piece I, I think I ever built other than that ring in the street. And um, there were, are very few, at that time, there were very few buildings in New York that had curves in them other than the Guggenheim uptown. So um, it became part of the life of downtown. And this piece and TWU and the next piece that's coming up, Tilted Arc, were all together. They were all up. These pieces went up in 80. I think Tilted Arc went up in 81. One, yeah. These pieces were all up for several years in lower Manhattan. Before I move on to Tilted Arc, what you're saying about there weren't that many curved buildings is you're talking about this as something on a scale of quasi-scale of architecture. Yeah, I think as soon as art gets off the pedestal, its comparative is um, um, buildings. Other, so you have to deal with its comparative to architecture in the urban space. And how much did you think when people were moving around this in terms of the speed and nature of seeing this from a car as opposed to walking along it? I would drive it almost every day back and forth through the tunnel with nothing there, and I would walk it every day, and I did that for months and months, and then I staked it out in various ways for months and months before we built it. So what was the difference between driving around it and so walking speed, around the, it? The speed of how it opens and closes. And actually, the most people who were going to see it, I realized, were people in the, in the, in the traffic. But there was also, a, there's a footbridge you can see where you can walk up and over. And the people could also see it from the footbridge. And actually, that footbridge is probably the best vantage point of it because you see into it. And it actually was placed in relation to the footbridge. And that had also been a space that was not really used by people. No, and it, had, and it had never had a work of art in it. Right, so the art became a destination as well. People went to it. Well, I, people who lived downtown passed by it every day. I don't know if they thought... How many it, people went into it? it actually, out onto, the, out onto over it. Over the footbridge and over there, yeah. No, the footbridge leads to uh, the street. The footbridge doesn't lead to the interior. No, no one walked out in there. The police wouldn't let you go out in there. So it was something you looked at, not something you Something you, you looked at that you didn't walk into. Okay. This is a work, this is a work called Tilted Arc, which people did obviously walk up to, around, and related to the previous work. Just describe, this, if you will, Tilted Arc. This was commissioned by the federal government, and uh, it was put, uh, they asked me if I would build a piece for this plaza. I thought the plaza was exceedingly ugly, and I thought the building behind it was uh, atrocious. And um, this piece is not a conical shape, which means it's not a cone. What it is is a cylinder tilted into the ground. If you, if you tilt a cylinder into the ground, the corners of the um, cylinder are impaled into the ground, and the middle of the cylinder is flush to the ground, which means that the form arcs in the center like a shell. It was 120 feet long. It stood there for two or three years, and then a judge in the building named Ray decided he didn't like it and um, said it was a rat pro causing a rat problem. Now, sculptures don't cause rat problems. That was a kind of a proto-fascist tactic. Then he had someone else say that if a terrorist put a device in front of it, it would implode the building, bring the building down. So they were thinking of it as a terrorist device. So they were using any kind of hostile, aggressive um, venues to uh, propaganda to do away with this work. Now, the government had seen this work before. They saw it when I built it uh, in the steel mill in the shipyard. They saw it uh, mocked up on the plaza and they passed on it all the way along, and the government up to that point had never destroyed a work of art 
that they had built by an artist. Right. And here, what they did is they put together a kangaroo court, put together a kind of a propaganda machine, and decided that they would um, open it to a public forum uh, that went on for days. People spoke on both sides, for and against. And then they wanted people to vote on it. At that point, I said something that has come back to haunt me because it's been misinterpreted. I said, art shouldn't be subject to a democratic vote. I said, you don't do that with scientists. I mean, I took it from uh, Brodsky who said, uh, art like science shouldn't be um, democratic in that way. You don't ask the scientist if he's bringing up a theory, if it's correct or not, and we'll have a vote on it. And you don't ask people to vote on the Constitution of the United States because if you had a plebiscite, they'd do away with it. Right. And you don't vote on, ask people to vote on art once it's been juried and decided upon, so the government has its right to destroy it. But all of this was a kind of a scapegoat tactic in order to destroy the work. So, Richard, before, because I feel like we've wandered into the territory of your first wife as well, I, I want to... No, but this, this went on for five years. Yeah, yeah, I know. My marriage didn't last that long. <laughs> but let's see, if we can, let's see if we can address some, because we're to, we've talked about certain themes here which Tilted Arc raises. So one of them, first of all, is the interaction with the work. Let's just stick to some very basic stuff. So you put this work in this plaza. It's very clear that it relates to the plaza itself. It relates to the larger area outside the plaza, which is hard to read from this photograph. But it also is clearly something in front of a building that people interact with. How much were you concerned with the way people interacted with the work? You were talking about the way things open and close, push towards you uh, in the Rotary Arc. How much were you concerned here with the interaction of people using the plaza and the building in terms of seeing the work? What it did was make a volume of space between itself and the stairs to the um, courthouse. And um, if you walked into that space, you were in the volume of the plaza that was created by the sculpture. So you were walking through a sculptural um, uh, space. space. Behind it is a, funk, a, a fountain, which never functioned. And when it, it rained, it leaked. So it was completely unusable. Their argument was they couldn't see their non-functioning fountain. The, the, their other argument was that it blocked um, the buildings across the street, which were one-story tattoo parlors and whatever. I don't know what, what it is they wanted to see. Yeah, to the north, yeah. yeah. And basically what the piece did was it pointed to the courthouse, to the federal courthouse. So the piece was right in a public space and it activated that public space. I mean, in other words, you thought of it when you were put, placing it in terms of creating two spaces, the space on which the fountain sits and then the space inside, essentially, the work. You no. weren't thinking of it as something that blocked space, right? No, but I also understood that it divided the plaza. Mm -hmm. I also understood that it separated the plaza to two areas. I understood that it had a volume interior to its concavity, and it had another volume of a different speed um, in relation to the, the block, um, it's not Church Street, I don't know which street it is right now, that runs um, east-west. Yeah, I'm sorry. So, so it, had a, a, it had two different kinds of readings. Right. And it, the piece actually stood there for years until this judge decided it had to go. And then people, then you did, then it was subject to this kind of uh, Rorschach test of, uh, of public opinion. And so this gets back to our earlier question of to what extent do you feel that um, your work uh, has some responsibility to the public that interacts with it when you put it in a public space? Ask the question again. That's the question now. <laughs> What responsibility do I have to yeah. the public? Yeah. Well, it was interesting. The day of the hearing, they took a vote, and more people were in favor of keeping the piece up than taking it down. In the newspaper the next day, they completely reversed the numbers and said more people wanted it down. After we went through all of these hearings, they decided to put together a blue ribbon commission of people from all over the United States. And this Blue Ribbon Commission was supposed to assess the piece and its public um, need and its reaction by going to 
different local community boards, whether it should stay up or not. And this Blue Ribbon Commission came back and said to the federal government, leave it up. And the federal government said, we received your report and we're taking it down. And by the way, just so everybody knows, that work has since been destroyed. Yeah, damn, yes, completely flattened like a pancake. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's come back to Tilt Rock 2, but I want to go to the next slide because it, it obviously relates to it very closely. This is a work you were doing in a similar moment, 82 to 84. It's in Barcelona, La Palmera, yeah? Yeah. And so describe it too, and I think if you could maybe make, draw some of the connections to Tilted Arc. Okay, this is actually the opposite of building a piece like for a federal institution. I was asked by a man named Boegis at the time between, in the 80s, early 80s. They were building pieces in public spaces all along the waterfront in Barcelona. And uh, Miro, the Miro Foundation had built a big park and they'd put a big mirror up. Ellsworth Kelly built a piece. Uh, Tapies built a very interesting piece in the street encased in fiberglass. I think about 10 artists participated and all the works are still there. And they asked me if I would build a piece on, near the Ramblas and I said, no, I think I'm going to go to a low, low cost housing development and see if I can do something. So I went to, the, and this place was an empty lot, about one block by two blocks, huge space. And it was just used for trash and garbage. And there was one area on the right-hand side with the kids used as a soccer field. And they said, okay, Richard, you can have it. It's yours to do what you want. And I thought, wow, I'm entering the Peace Corps here. And I had to teach the people how to mix the cement. And then I had to teach myself how to make forms that would bend, and I used, um, uh, masonite and a, a kind of a lever system in order to make the forms parallel and even. And we tr hand troweled the cement in and poured it in. And it, it took um, about two years of my life with a, and people would never show up. And we built this large park and on one side we planted trees and we built a, um, a bandstand. And on the interior side we built um, a space for kids to play soccer and we put stairs on one side that people could sit along, on during the daytime. Along the right side there next yeah. to the And doors. then we built a, t a tower, uh, much like coming out of Russian constructivism, almost like a light tower that you'd see in a football stadium, that lighted the entire plaza. This um, is still up. It's still enjoyed by thousands of people on the weekend. Now, when you're asking about public service and doing things for the good of the greater community, this piece was done in that spirit, almost as um, the reversal of the experience I had gone through in America with Tilted Arc working right. for a government institution. The problem I had with it is I, I had to build it in cement uh, and I didn't like the way it was finished particularly. And as much as I thought I was making a contribution to the need and well-being of this neighborhood, because I had turned this completely lot that had been devastated into something that was usable as you know, multi-part aesthetic and park and soccer field, I didn't think that I was extending my vocabulary as a sculptor as much as making a public service commitment to the greater good for the greater number. Let me interrupt you a second. Yeah. Okay. So if you ask me, can it be done? Yes, it can be done. I did it. Do I think it satisfied my needs as a sculptor? Not entirely. Right, so you're saying by the it in that case, to be clear, you mean it meaning doing a public service kind of work. Yeah. You, kind of, you described it as Peace Corps work, in other words, yes. training people how to help you do this in the community. Yeah, but, uh, but let's stick to the formal nature of this for a second. You were describing Tilted Arc as separating two spaces, creating two different kinds of areas, which could be used differently, and would be seen in relation, would be perceived differently, depending on where in the surrounding area you were. Would you say that, formally speaking, this relates to Tilted Arc? I hadn't thought so at the time. Maybe, maybe it does in retrospect, but at the time I didn't think that. Why not? Uh, I thought I was making, actually, I went, myself was making a park, and I was also making a soccer field. I was also making a division between the way from, to go from the soccer field to the park. And I understood the needs of the elderly to have a park and a place to sit and benches and a bandstand. And I understood the needs of the younger kids that were there because when I went there during the day, that's what they would do. They would ride their bicycles and use it as a soccer field. So basically what I tried to do was to satisfy the needs of both constituents. And I tried to give them also a place where they could sit in the sun on the stairs. So 
I so I, I was entering the role, which, which I think artists have always played, is that is in the discourse between um, architecture and art. And right. did I think that um, it was successful in that discourse? Yes. Did I think it satisfied my needs as a sculptor? Not entirely. So at the risk of asking a question which I, I, uh, might bother you, had you approached Tilted Arc the same way? That is to say, had you begun it as a project that you saw as a kind of, as you put it, a Peace Corps project? Now, not talking about using the materials, but, you know, enlisting the community, what did they want, how would they have wanted to use this space? Do you think you would have ended up in a very different place? The building that fronts Tilted Arc is, is an immigration building. Yep. It's where thousands of immigrants come every day. Right, but there are workers who use the building who are, who are there as well. I mean, yeah, there are but people it's who really use the not their neighborhood. So it's really a place that immigrants are coming to for, mm -hmm. the, for the first time. And all of them passed. And what I did is I, stu I studied the traffic patterns of the, the plaza. And I built the piece in relation to the traffic patterns. And people basically would walk along the sidewalk and under the building, or they would walk right in front of the plaza, but they would not walk with the, up the stairs where the fountain was at all. Right. You looked at what... I, was looking, I looked at how the space was used and tried to augment right. the viewing of how it would be used. Right. In architecture, this is, in design, this is called desire lines. You looked at the desire lines, the way people actually want to use a space. The architects really use that word, desire yeah. lines? Desire lines, nice, right? <laughs> Sounds like they're building a bra. It's, it's, I actually love it, yeah. <laughs> Let's go on for a second. This is a piece called uh, Clara Clara, which was made for Paris. Let me just say a little bit. So it was made for a show you did at Pompidou, is that right? Yes. And then it was moved by the city of Paris. It was moved by Dominique Bozo, who was the, Bozo. the director at the time, asked the city if they would place it there for the duration. And where is there? There, as you can see, is in line with the Champs-Élysées, uh, facing the Place de Concorde, with the Arc de Triomphe at the other end. At and the... it's the entrance of the Tuileries of the park. So I have to say that it was reinstalled some years ago when I was living in Europe. I didn't know it was there, and I suddenly started to walk through the Tuileries and walked toward the Concorde, and there it was, framing perfectly, which this photograph doesn't quite do, but framing perfectly the column in the Concorde and then down the, the Champs-Élysées. It was an amazing experience. It looked like it had been site-specific, that this was a work which had absolutely been made for only this particular place. And to watch people funnel in and then see that view was very beautiful. So my question to you is, um, I want to get back to this issue of the patronage of it, but let me just first ask you, since this work was not actually made for this site, how interesting is it to you that the site, in a way, changed the meaning or enhanced the meaning of the work? I think Dominique Bozo was a brilliant man, and I think he realized the potential of the piece. And I also think he realized that he had a problem putting it in his building. So I think he looked for an alternative, and he, he thought this piece would probably echo the baroqueness of the entrance of the park and make two uh, different spaces, concavities on both sides. The forms are exactly the same inverted, so when you turn one upside down, it makes a leaning uh, space between the two. And I think it was Bozo's genius to uh, actually find the um, intersection of political will an economy to bring it there and leave it there. And, and when it was there, it was very, very much appreciated and enjoyed by the public. Thousands of people would funnel through it every day. Yeah, spectacular. I guess what I'm also asking by that, though, is to what extent, you know, you, you describe the nature of your work as being very uh, singular. You're involved in these questions of your own work and pushing your own syntax. And when you divert from that to take on another agenda, as you were doing in Barcelona, you see that as somehow um, like a cul-de-sac away from the work. But here, I guess the question that's raised is, to what extent does the, this outside effect on the work, somebody else coming in, placing it, the interaction of people with that work, how much does that affect you? I guess emotionally, obviously, you must be very satisfied but even affect the way you see making your own work? Is there any way in which you would want to create that kind of interaction? I didn't think that if I proposed a piece to put in the Tuileries, anybody would ever accept it. 
nor did I have the courage to do that. I wasn't going to go to the town hall and go to the and ask if I could have a permit to build a piece in the Tuileries. There was no way that that was going to happen. Right. Dominique Bozo, which had a lot of political power at the time, thought he could convince Jack Lang and other people who was the Minister of Culture at the time to place it in the Tuileries, and, and they did it. And to, to, to my amazement, I thought that that was an impossibility. And did I think it was a good idea when they showed me the site to place it there? I could have said no. I, but I said, absolutely, go right ahead, be my guest. Right, I mean, you do say no. You were telling me the other day that it came up here, for instance, in Rio at some point, whether you could do a sculpture at that corner of uh, the Atlantico on the, on, the, on the water in Copacabana, and you thought no, even though it is a very conspicuous site right there on the beach. Why did you say no to that? It was a postcard reality, and I think what happens with any work of art is that, um, like the work at the end of the street, when you see sites and you see works of art, you don't just see them in relationship to their physical properties. You don't see any object in relation to its physical properties. You see them through your memory. So you see it both virtually and physically simultaneously. And I think, um, I'm getting off the point here. What was the question? <laughs> it's okay. I was asking you basically why you didn't want to do it on that site. And the reason I asked you that question was here there was the serendipity of somebody choosing a site for you. I wondered, in fact, whether had someone said, can you just do a site right here at this, this perfect entrance to the Tuileries, you might not also have said, you know, it's just a touristic Oh, you're, we're place. going back to the piece here on, on the postcard site. The right? Rio, right, here in Rio. Yeah, I thought that in some instances, the context can actually override the content. So I would never build a piece probably within an army barracks. Uh, there are certain institutions I wouldn't build for. Mm -hmm. I thought the site at the end of the Coca Cabana was going to be co-opted by the tourist industry about let's build um, a Kukchatchka for the end of the Coca Cabana, right. or let's put a, a figure, which they have now, on right. a pedestal. And most of that work is bound to fail, because I didn't think that my work, given the nature of that site, could challenge what I needed to do in order to make my work. And I did find some spaces downtown, which I thought were very interesting, but mm. no one was particularly interested in Here. intervening. Yes. Yeah. Let's go on a bit. We don't have a lot of time. I want to skip over this, and I just go quickly and come to some of the end. By the way, tell me about this work here, because we're talking about public consensus. Uh, this is called um, Bo uh, Intersection. It's in Basel. Uh, they commissioned, the town commission. It's, it's from the early 90s, 92 or something like yes, that. Yes, and the, the, the town commissioned the work to put it up, and uh, then they also decided that they would have a vote on whether to keep it there or not. So they had, it was a, fought out in the paper every day. And the town of Basel, voted to keep it up, and it's still up. And, uh, and it fronts the um, opera house. So uh, people can walk through it, and it creates spaces where I assume, you know, if you're uh, the New York City Police Department, you wouldn't want this. There, people can't be seen. You would need cameras parked all along the sculpture and so forth. I mean, um, obviously this was not so much of a concern to the Swiss. It's not a concern to you either. I think surveillance is everywhere. <laughs> it is, increasingly. But what I'm saying is this is, it's the kind of tension you have, right, between works of, between works of art that need to fill certain kinds of public criteria. Maybe they have to do with criteria, safety, uh, you know, the ability of, of uh, people to clean the work, to maintain it, these kinds of things. Th this is also part of a public art agenda, isn't it? I think once the town takes it upon themselves to accept the work, then they take on the responsibility to upkeep the work. And that's built into the notion of the work from the get-go. So they know once it becomes their property, it's their responsibility. Do you, do you care, by the way, if they do or don't maintain it and how they do, whether people yeah, paint I, I, it? Yeah, I, I care because this piece gets tagged all the time. So finally we tagged got... Tagged, meaning with graffiti. Yeah, so, so finally we got to the point of putting a kind of waterproofing on it so if they tag it, you can just take a hot hose and blow the graffiti off. But in some sense, I don't, I mind if it gets tagged because it kind of destroys looking at it, but in some sense, I understand young people wanting to tag it, to get, to get their name on it, to, get, to make their Mark. aesthetic known. And I, I can understand the impetus behind that. 
So I'm kind of conflicted about, not conflicted about cleaning it, but conflicted about when it gets tagged. Right. It's interesting, in some cities, pieces don't get tagged. There was, there's a piece in London at Broadgate, um, which has been up for, I don't know, since here it is right here. Um, this is at the end of Liverpool Station, so a, a great deal of people empty out into this plaza every day, of thousands. And uh, this piece has been up since when did it go up? Yeah, yeah it went up in, also in 92. And, uh, no, I'm sorry, no, 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 that's not true, in, in the 80s, mid-80s, 86 or 7. Yeah, and, and this piece, you can walk inside and you can look up and it's open to the sky and it has uh, two entrances and uh, it's been there and it's never been tagged and uh, people go in, go out, pass by, uh, it's been maintained. Mm. Um, the notion of taking it down came up, city voted to keep it up. So you never know about a context, and that's what we said before. Mm. And you never know about the consequence of an act. Yeah. Peace in Bochum still up. Peace in London still up. Peace in Basel got voted to stay up. So you don't know because you would thought at the beginning, if you would offer something like this up, it would be rejected across the board. So you don't know until it gets out in the public realm. And oftentimes what happens is the public becomes converted. Yeah. Not only do they become converted, they take pride in the fact that it's part of their daily life because they grow up with it. This is in the Rugerby in the, in the Ruhr Valley. In West Germany? Yes, in the, uh, in, near Dortmund. And the coal mines had gone belly up. And there was this enormous slag heap of about, oh, a hill of about oh, a mile long and uh, half a mile wide. And it was just dunnage and, and slag and dump and toxin waste that had been going on for 30 or 40 years. And they said, Richard, this is yours to deal with. So what I did is I got the uh, town's people involved with their moving capabilities, and I took it on the shape of a football. So it has a reverse curve. It curves like this, and it curves like that. And we created a large, empty hill out of black coal. So you have an empty hill where there was just mounds and mounds of coal and waste and debris. We have a, a shaped hill on the top, and then I took a single plate and implanted it right on the top, and it's become almost a symbol of a tomb of the decline of the coal industry in Germany. And it's thought of that way. You're describing something very interesting, Richard, because of course, you know, the outrageous, if I may say, and, and incredible thing that happened with Tilted Arc has in some sense colored, I think, people's perceptions of your work as being in some way, you know, having a, uh, you know, a built-in public resistance. This is, in fact, not true. Well, it, it's true and not true. I mean, I can also tell you the, the number of commissions I've had that have fallen apart and the number of commissions I've had that never got off the ground, so you never know. Yeah, but you're suggesting... Well, also, there's a piece up in St. Louis that's been up since, it's, I mean, it's been up for over 20, 25 years, so there are pieces, there's a lot of pieces that are up. Yeah. In a certain sense, the work that you've been doing over the last, you know, 10 or 15 years has become so immensely popular, people love it, that it's, it's created a very different impression of the nature of your work, I think, which is, you know, that the, uh, the, you, the, you make these things which are full of pleasure. People love... I think that's a stretch. You think? Yeah, I think popular is a stretch, and I think pleasure is a stretch, but it's okay. Does it, is it bad if I say that you're popular and it's, it's the, the cause pleasure? No, I just think it's wrong-headed. <laughs> Well, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I, I want to push it. I'm not going to give up for a second because since we're talking about the reaction to the I don't think work, this enters the realm of pop culture. No, I didn't mean it in a pop culture way. I don't think it ends the realm of popularity. I think if you took a poll in Germany, yeah. it wouldn't be popular, but you would find it on a crossword puzzle. Okay. So in the, the word popular bothers you, but what I mean is... It's that, part of their culture now. Yeah in this case, but I'm talking about something else. I'm just saying that the evolution of your work, the recent work you've been doing in the last, as I said, decade or two, has increasingly moved towards the kinds of things that we, in people's interactions with them, they describe as you know, being full of pleasure, revelation, excitement. Much of the discourse about your work earlier on was a much more aggressive, uh, antagonistic, um, difficult relationship. Yeah, but I have to tell you, I'm trying to 
define what I think sculpture ought to be for myself right. and for the context. Yeah. Now, no one's to say that if you take a slag heap and turn it into a tomb or a mound of a graveyard and stick a plate in it, that people are going to like it. You don't know. Right. Right. It's interesting that you are, I, I mean, I sense your dis slight discomfort when I say that your work causes more people to like what you do. I just don't know if it's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think it is true, but by the way, I don't want to get too far off this. I think, I think there's this. a difference. I think there's a difference between the work being respected mm -hmm. and the, um, the notion of the will to do and to make being respected and to challenge and resist being respected. I'm not sure if it's exact pleasure. I think they think, this guy's going to go ahead and make what he wants to make anyway. Let him have it. Right. Um, maybe. I, I, think, I think you're concerned about, the, about it not being perceived as easy or that it doesn't, it's not challenging because people may react uh, with excitement and pleasure to it. But I'm, that's not exci at all what I'm saying. By the way, I think, if I may just say, I don't want to get too far off here, I think one of the interesting things about the work is how it combines elements of your very early work, which gets us back to the things you were doing in felt, like the prop pieces and and, and, and lead with like prop pieces. Rubber. And, and rubber, saying. and rubber I mean, I'm sorry, I meant rubber. Um, in terms of their, their shape, you're essentially using steel in ways you did with early on with rubber. And I think this is, there's a certain kind of, uh, not closure exactly, but sort of bringing together all these different elements of your work, which is incredibly exciting. I'm not sure that's how people react to it. I think people love to go into this spaces you create and go around them and the scale of them is awesome and, and very interesting. Um, well, I think, if I can interrupt a second, yeah. I, th I think there was a sea change when the torque ellipses came up. Yep. Because those pieces were, you could enter into and through and around, and they were spaces that hadn't been conceived before in architecture and hadn't been conceived before in any kind of tectonics. And they were freestanding and they seemed to be weightless even though they weighed hundreds of tons. Right. And they had a certain speed and a certain sheltering quality to them. So um, they came not that far after Tilted Arc. Right. And what happened was there was a shift in the audience. The, aud the people who were my generation still thought of me as being an aggressive, no good, get rid of this guy. But their sons and daughters went in to see the Torque Ellipses exactly. and moved into them. And I came down one weekend and you know, people were sitting inside of them. Now, I didn't know that that was going to happen. You can't foresee right. the consequence of how people are going to react. Right. Because I think if, you're, if you try to foresee the consequences of how people are going to react, then you might as well take a poll and you can do a readout and you'll end up making it pink with a few holes in it. Right, which is back where we were. Let me just go move quickly through the last two things we have. The, this is uh, work at the Grunt Play. I don't want you to spend a lot of time explaining it, but if you could just briefly describe what it is. This is in the Grand Palais in Paris. Yeah, I took the Grand Palais and I took a center line of the Grand Palais and I leaned plates on about a three degree angle, which means that the top of the plate, if you put a plumb line down, is right on line with the central axis. And then there are plates that are um, about a foot and a half off so that they lean away from the central axis. So the piece moves in and out of the center line and activates the space as you as walk As you it. move through it across yeah, the space. Yeah, and it's evenly spaced 100 feet apart and it took the length and height of the Grand Palais. I had no idea until the piece went up because you couldn't mock it up beforehand if in fact it was going to hold the volume of the space. And it was just a joy to work there because the light in the Grand Palais, um, and the reason I'm, we showed this piece is the Grand Palais functions as a public space. People walk right off the street into the Grand Palais, so other than it being a museum institution, the people who go to the Grand Palais aren't necessarily the people who go to the Centre Pompidou. Yep. Everyone goes to the Grand Palais. Right. So it's, a, it's like the Galleria in Milan or yeah, something. That's right. People yes. can walk through and, and see the space. Did you, um, uh, and you did this for the exhibition, you didn't do this for the city? No. Yeah. No. And lastly, let's just talk about this, this, both of these works. This is a, a view from, obviously, a far away, and this is the view again, yeah? Of yeah. the work itself. Yeah. So this is a work called Seven, which you finished in Qatar in 2011. Yeah, I went to Qatar, and this is um, the Islamic Museum built by IMP, 
And what IMPE had done is there's a corniche that runs along uh, the waterfront there, it comes from the airport out to the waterfront, and goes all the way around, you can see the buildings in the background. When I first went there 12 years ago, there were no buildings, it was one building, Sheridan Hotel, and it was just desert beyond. IMPE went there, went out into the water, uh, dug up all of the earth and put it over on the right-hand side. Uh, and the right-hand interior corniche, this half-moon shape that he built, wasn't completed. And he asked me if I would come there and deal with the problem of his mound of dirt that was out there. And I went there and looked at it, and it was up about 20, 30 feet high. And I was standing there with two of his architects, and they said, so Richard, um, can you help us with our urban planning with the park? And I said, oh, I have an idea. And they said, what's that? I said, I want to go out in the water 175 feet. I want something about 75 feet wide. We'll build a uh, kind of a plaza that moves out into the water, a pier. We'll put steps on one side facing the museum. I'll build a work out there that connects to the museum. So then I went through the history of all the minarets from uh, Spain to Yemen. And um, I came across one in uh, Ganzi that was built in the 12th century that had um, planes, not cylindrical, planes that flared out from the center. And it seemed possible for me to take that seven plate piece and dovetail it into my concerns. And there's a woman named Sheikha Mayasa who's kind of the cultural spearhead of the government there. And she and her husband came and watched the development of the models. And the models went from 40 feet high to 50 feet high to 60 feet high to six plates, eight plates, five plates, whatever. And then at one point, the space that you walked into was 24 feet wide. And then at one point, um, I thought, I ought to really go high. And I ought to really make it a, 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 an enclosure that is open to the museum. So I got down to plates that were very thin. They were only eight feet wide, and they were 80 feet high. And I made the space that you walk into only 10 feet across. And at the height of 80 feet, you're looking at us out of the seven sided aperture that's nine feet across. So basically, you're standing in a shaft. And the shaft has three uh, openings between the plates that are 80 feet high. And if you stand in one of them and facing the museum, it brings the museum right into the space of the piece. So it ties the museum into the sculpture. And then, along with uh, the helps of the architects, um, I had a lot to do with the designing of the park. And now, uh, th before this park went up, this space was not used. And on the weekends now, thousands, literally thousands of people use this park and enjoy it. Um, it's become kind of their flagship sculpture. It's an icon for the, for the city. More or less. Yeah. Because it's out in the water, and it, it kind of functions out in the water as something antithetical to the architecture that has gone up. But and, well, actually, why don't you show the next slide, actually, yep. give you an idea. That's the city in the background. That's the piece at the end of the pier. And it appears almost to be floating like uh, um, on a, a barge out in the middle of the water. And the piece is uh, 80 feet high. And those buildings probably behind are probably about a oh, quarter mile away. And they're probably up to 60 or 70 stories. And the piece is really antithetical to the um, kind of architecture that's being built there now, which for the most part is postmodern mock um, Arab facade tacked on to rectilinear, curvilinear buildings, and it's a kind Kitch. of a joke, yeah. Do, but I'm sure it'll all be demolished in 30 would years. You say your work is <laughs> would you say your work is architectural? No, it's sculpture. There's no building that looks like this. What's the difference? Uh, I think use for one. Architecture has, involves use. Yeah, and I think sculpture is purposely useless. So before we open up to questions, which we should do... That doesn't mean that it yeah. doesn't have an aesthetic uh, component. And architecture, you mean? No, it's sculpture. Right. right. It, may, it may be useless in terms of yeah. the utility of use, but that yeah. doesn't mean that people can't learn from it. Right. But, it, but you meant, you were talking about use in terms of architecture. You're basically saying architecture has certain things it must do. You need a window, you need a door. Yeah, you need a, there's typologies in architecture. There's staircases, there's doors, there's windows, there's lots of things. Yeah. I don't have to answer to those things. And when architects describe what they're doing as a form of art? No, I think, think that there's always been a discourse between art and architecture, and I think there's been cross-referencing, but I think 
architects understand that part of what they do they think is aesthetic, and that's all well and good, but they understand that they're not making, quote, art, they're making architecture. They're making buildings. They're making something that has a public use. I'm not making something that has a public use, but it might be useful for a lot of a host of other reasons. And the last thing I want to ask you before, just to tie back to some of the things you're saying. So we're in a city where the, the question came up as well earlier, you know, what is the use of, uh, in terms of making urban improvements in the city, in terms of addressing needs of neighborhoods here and uh, uh, communities? What, what is the role of art? What do you think I it think is? to challenge public awareness. I think to, uh, cities that are vital, uh, Seattle's a good, they just Seattle, built an enormous exactly. Olympic sculpture park. Thousands of people go every weekend. I think cities that are vital support their arts. And I think here, they need, and they probably will, and they are supporting their arts, and I think that's to the good. Shall, shall we open up to questions? We're running uh, embarrassingly late. Então, abrir para perguntas. Se vocês é, tiverem, elas vão ser feitas por escrito. Eu, eu queria começar, então, eu vou fazer uma pergunta antes uh, de chegar nas perguntas do público, vocês vocês terminaram uh, essa conversa falando da importância da arte é, desafiar então a, a cidade e desafiar no caso do Rio de Janeiro ou de outras cidades brasileiras a desigualdade na cidade. É, esses são processos espontâneos que acontecem nas cidades ou é preciso envolver outros atores como o governo, como a sociedade civil? Esse processo de acolher a arte como um instrumento capaz de desafiar as cidades são processos espontâneos ou precisam ser processos mais planejados? I think a bit of both. I, th I think if there's too much of a government um, input unless the government is very enlightened um, you, you may have you may be turning artists into civil servants but I think it comes down to the um, capabilities of the artist and his willingness or her willingness to interact with the supporting powers whether they be government or um, private or whether they be and if, if they're spontaneous then it's how much they can get away with Eu sei que tem já as perguntas, se vocês quiserem me trazer. Bom, é... Uma das questões aqui é voltando, então, a, a, a essa ideia da relação da obra com o, o lugar. E a pergunta traz justamente como o senhor, é, como foi para o senhor situar uma obra no local onde quase ninguém, pelo menos na época, é, queria ir. É, e o que, que isso poderia levar e é, alguma reflexão sobre a condição daquele lugar, ou mudar uma, a... a, a a visão que as pessoas têm ou tinham daquele lugar. At, at that point, I just wanted to um, build a work in the street, and I wanted to try to define um, a new kind of sculpture. So I wasn't too worried about the audience, and I think the people who were torching cars could have cared less. They had no idea what I... They thought I could have worked for the sewer department. They didn't know who I was. And uh, I, had, I had good relationships with them because obviously I wasn't from the police department. And um, 
I had a good relationships with the people in the neighborhood, but it was completely not understood by the art world nor viewed by the art world. Now it's owned by the St. Louis Art Museum. O seu trabalho é feito, é sempre feito de um, dentro de um projeto. Qual, no seu processo criativo, qual é o papel do acaso? You mean in relation to the context, in relationship to the to the audience, the clients of the context? I mean, how much feedback do I get? Is that the question? Does serendipity include the, the reflex of people in the context? Yeah, I don't know, but that's an interesting question. Is that what you mean by serendipity? No, I think, a, I think the question means how much, is, how much do you just arrive at forms serendipitously and how much is it a conscious evolution of your thinking? No, that, the, 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 the scale comes directly out of analyzing the, process, the, con, the context. So to a degree, the site dictates what I do. So I study the site. Oftentimes, I make full-scale mock-ups in the site. And I try to deal with the circulation, subsurface condition, uh, passage of the sun, as many of uh, the things that augment the site I deal with. So in, the answer is not much serendipity. No. Quando você fez seu trabalho no Centro de Artes Hélio de Sica, aqui no Rio, você pensou nele originalmente como um trabalho permanente ou temporário? A, a temporary. I didn't think anything would remain. Although I think I think there are uh, three circles above the arches that I understand may remain there. Tem uma pergunta aqui, se você quiser comentar, sobre a Copa do Mundo no Brasil e sua relação com a cidade. Você tem algum comentário a esse respeito? Eu estou feliz que não vou estar aqui. Por que não terminamos aqui? Ok? A gente vai terminar por aqui. Muito obrigada. Muito obrigada, Richard Serra e Michael Kuhlman.